Anyway, it's, it is changing ice, it's changing technology, and it's global demand that is opening up Arctic shipping. The fact is, is that the largest lead zinc mine in the world is in Red Dog, Alaska. The largest uh, iron ore mine in the world is being built, uh, will be built at, uh, on Baffin Island in Canada with 365 day a year shipping out of there. The largest uh, nickel mine in the world is at uh, Norilsk in Russia. So you've got three very large scale mines that, that require Arctic shipping to bring their goods to market. Then you have what Arctic shipping has meant, especially for Russia and Norway, and will probably mean also for us in North America, is that it opens up new strategic markets for energy. So the Russians, you know, on the one hand, we look at Russia as perhaps an unstable energy partner, and we've argued that with our European friends and allies for a long time. We've had the Caspian policy, uh, you know, you know, route your pipeline so somebody can't turn off the tap. Yet we're kind of ignoring the fact that Russia, uh, uh, Russia will be a major player in Arctic energy production. So they're establishing Arctic shipping lanes right now, uh, which will be a significant part of global energy shipment for time to come. I mean, the the fact that in conventional oil and gas, about a quarter of the energy to be found uh, left in the world, according to the USGS estimates, is 13 percent of the world's oil, 23 percent of the world's gas. But that's just conventional get into some of the others, I believe it's ultimately more significant. Uh, that's coming out of the Arctic. We need to begin to think about the Arctic geostrategically and say, okay, how do we make sure that these sea lanes are secure and, and uninterruptible? And yeah, you may say, well, the Russians aren't going to cut themselves off. Well, they occasionally do. But the Norwegians have said let, they're going to use the sea route to bring LNG to Japan. Uh, the Koreans are looking at bringing LNG via the Arctic from Canada to Korea. Uh, we had major shipments of aviation fuel flowing backwards on the backhauls of gas condensate shipments last year uh, from Russia to East Asia. So my view of Arctic shipping is that first off it's three things that are driving it, not just one. Second is that it's basically going to be bulk commodities that that make it work for the next 10 years. But it's that, the operating experience derived there, the confidence you'll give insurers, the small investments that coastal states will make in aids to navigation and port facilities and so forth will ultimately open this route to container shipping where they need reliability more than anything else. I mean, if you put iron ore on a, on a tanker, yeah, or on a bulk carrier, rather. If it gets there a day late or so, it's not going to mess up just in time delivery. On the other hand, if you put, you know, this spring's fashion, uh, you know, the textiles coming out of East Asia, you know, and you miss the opening of the Paris spring dress sales or whatever, uh, you've, you've got a problem. So you need greater reliability in the Arctic for, I think, goods, goods trade. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't think about it. And I've had conversations as late as last Friday with senior officials at the world's largest shipping companies uh, where we're trying to figure out where we go as the next step.